So because I have a very big panel, we'll start with the questions and then we can be introducing ourselves as we respond, I hope uh, that's okay. So the first question will go to everyone briefly, hopefully under two minutes for everybody. Can we get to share why we from uh, the crossover itself. I'll start with you, Honorable. Thank you. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank all the organizations that made this event pres um, possible today. I'm truly humbled to be in the presence of such inspirational women because it is also motivating not only to me, but to every other young girl around the world. Um, what really motivated me was um, my life, I should say, because growing up, I grew up in an area where um, early marriages and teenage pregnancies were something that was too normal and too common. So growing up and seeing my friends being married off, growing up and seeing my friends becoming mothers is something that pushed me to say, I want to speak for a platform for, them, for themselves. So whenever um, we see uh, female leaders, it's a reminder to all of us to say, my, I am not voiceless, they're able to speak for me because we have the same experiences. Um, I joined because every time I aired my grievances, I couldn't relate with someone who was a man because they didn't know what I was going through. So crossing over into becoming part of the force and part of the table is something that was very pivotal to me. It was a very um, challenging experience and it wasn't easy being at a young age but it was something that felt necessary because there were so many things that were unsaid and so many things that were not done and they felt like only a youth can speak for a youth and only a woman can speak for a woman thank you okay thank you good afternoon everyone um abiyonu is a former special advisor to the abuja municipal area council mayor and currently the consultant development partner to Abuja Municipal Area Council. Abuja is the federal capital territory of um, Nigeria. And I, as an activist, I've been in civil society for more over 15 years before I moved into partisan politics. And I decided to cross over for knowing well fully well as a gender activist because I wanted a greater, greater impact of some of the development projects that I was doing. I felt the government was the greatest partner that you could work with to have a greater impact on what um, you're doing well. So as a gender activist, I've been advocating for women's inclusion in leadership and development space. And I felt, okay, I've been talking about this. Why not just, you know, give it a trial and, you know, practice what I preach. And also I decided to start at the local level because I felt the local level was really similar to the gender role of a woman in the sense that the local government addresses sanitation, market, school, and primary education. All these things affect women's life directly. And I discovered that women are not in the leadership structure at that local level. So why will you have a government that addresses most of the things and you are more aware about the impact of those things in your community and you are not there when it comes to leadership structure. So I decided to run as a counselor at the local level to have a greater impact on what, I, uh, what I'm supposed to do and also in the society. And what I've learned is, you know, crossing over to government gives you a complete perspective of development work. We've learned so much in the civil society. It's a different ball game in government. So, you know, I had now I have a balanced understanding of how development works. Maybe we'll talk about that later. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Christine Kungu. I am the vice chairperson of the FIDA Kenya, an NGO based in Nairobi that deals with issues of legal aid um, for indigent women. For me, I am not the example of the crossover, but my organization is a good example. Uh, FIDA Kenya, we have been uh, basically uh, taking charge of women who want to cross over from uh, civil society to leadership. Currently, we have done uh, very well. Uh, the first ever female chief justice serving in Kenya today is a member of FIDA. And she crossed over from civil society to judiciary, and now she's the head 
of uh, the judiciary, and that is one of the benefits. Another crossover that we undertook, but uh, perhaps was not successful, for the very first time in 2022 elections, our member, uh, Martha Karua, uh, was a candidate for vice president in Kenya, even though she was not successful. But for the very first time, we had a woman vying for that particular position, something that has not happened all those years that we've been independent. Lessons have been learned. We know where to kick, uh, to pick up in the next five years. But for us, we've seen crossing over as a leading example in Africa can happen and we'll continue uh, doing it. And I'll give my uh, strategies later on of how this can happen. Thank you. Um, good morning. My name is Lala Ture and I am from the Gambia. I work with the National Youth Council of the Gambia and provide um, policy advice to the Gambian government on youth issues. Um, so what um, motivated me to cross over, I believe, has is hunger. As a young girl growing up in an underprivileged community in the Gambia, I had always been hungry about bringing change to my country, bringing change to my people, um, in having an impact, a positive impact in the lives and livelihood of my people in my country. And I started with, um, actually, when I started, I started with civil society and then I transitioned into working with political parties and then I transitioned into now this position that I hold. And I started with civil society. Um, before I started with civil society, I was the youngest staff hired by the Truth, Reconciliation and Reparations Commission in the Gambia. And this was set up, as most of you probably know, Gambia had a dictatorship and this was set up by an act of parliament to look into the human rights violations that were committed by the former president and to make sure that victims and survivors were given the compensation and the justice that they deserve. And my role was to facilitate women's participation in this process, but also ensure the TRRC process in the Gambia was gender responsive um, and gender, gender sensitive. So from there, I worked with a civil society organization to provide capacity building support to young women who are looking to hold positions of political power within political parties. And then I moved on to becoming a member, the youngest executive member of the Gambia's leading political party in the Gambia. And my work there was to facilitate the enhanced engagement of young people, particularly young women, doing grassroots mobilization and ensuring that whatever policies and programs this political party was bringing to the people, People. It was addressing the needs of women at the grassroots level. It was addressing the needs of women at the national level. And until recently, when I was appointed by my government to hold this role as a female representative at the National Youth Council, um, I have always, I've always known what I wanted to do as a young woman in my country. And I feel like being in this position now gives me um, a better platform, a bigger platform to be able to influence policy, to be able to bring about the change that I want from a level where it is actually uh, very beneficial. Because when you're within civil society, sometimes your um, the level at which you're able to impact things sometimes can be very difficult because of government's perspective or what civil society is about. And there's a huge gap in my country between civil society and government. So being in this position has provided me with the opportunity to bring about more impact. Good morning. Um, my name is Menesiana Piri Chibwe. I'm a member of parliament for Milanzi constituency. It's uh, in the eastern part of uh, Zambia in Katete district. Um, Milanzi constituency is um, one of the uh, poorest constituencies in um, Zambia. Uh, so you can imagine uh, representing such um, a, const a constituency. But also I am one of the um, uh, uh, female members of parliament that uh, uh, were elected. I'm representing a small number of elected female members of uh, parliament in the Zambian parliament. Crossing over, I was um, a journalist for close to 22 years and I decided to join politics. Why? I wanted to um, save uh, the community where I grew up. I partly grew up in the village, right in the constituency where I, I work from. So I wanted to represent uh, my people, uh, knowing very well that, uh, you know, it's um, a poor constituency. The area lacks um, uh, clean drinking water. There are very few schools, uh, you know, uh, poor road network, but also um, very limited um, health infrastructure. And I thought that I needed to uh, give back 
by uh, standing up and speaking for the community. That's how I decided to join politics. It has not been an easy journey, a lot of challenges. Stereotyping is real. I uh, faced a lot of uh, challenges in terms of um, finances. You know, you, you are pitting against um, men that um, are financially stable. You have um, uh, women not supporting you because they feel that uh, you cannot be represented by you know a woman, and uh, it's 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 really sad that uh, women would look down uh, on you, thinking that uh, you do not have the capacity to represent them. Yeah, the uh, political party has um, uh, its own criteria of um, adoption. So the challenges are so real. I'll talk about that later. Thank you. Thank you and hello again. Uh, I am Lesia Vasilenko, Member of Parliament from Ukraine. And I did cross over uh, in 2019 uh, when I ran for uh, the national elections and was elected. Uh, as I was represented here, I, I am uh, an international lawyer uh, by trade and I worked in the uh, corporate segment. But then in 2014, uh, when Russia's aggression against Ukraine first started, there was a huge number of men and women who were going to fight for Ukraine, for their country and defending Ukraine. But they were coming back from this war, uh, injured, wounded, some families would have lost. And every single one of uh, these people from the military and the veteran community was feeling lost and not knowing what to do. And the state was not caring for them because the state didn't know how to care for them because Ukraine hasn't been at war for uh, all of its free independent livelihood. So me being a lawyer by training, um, I started providing legal advice. I started reading into the laws of Ukraine, the existing laws of Ukraine and pushing government, central government, local government to care for the defenders of Ukraine who were coming back from this war uh, wounded. And this grew into the Legal 100 NGO, which became one of the largest NGOs, civil society movements in Ukraine, standing up for the rights of the defenders of Ukraine. Defending the defenders of Ukraine was our motto. Uh, and uh, the, the, from a, an initiative, a personal initiative that came from my heart, it grew into a huge civil society organization, which then pushed the government and the parliament to uh, create a special ministry of veterans affairs in Ukraine. I advocated for that personally. I uh, gathered the votes necessary in the Ukrainian parliament being a civil society activist. And I also rallied the civil society community to stand up for this. And so this journey was not easy. It was uh, complex, but also opened a lot of doors in uh, committees in parliament, in uh, government, in even the office of the president of the Ukraine at the time. Uh, so I was so involved and so well known that at the end of the day, when the election time came, I was just asked, why don't you run? Have you had not enough uh, uh, making the policies in the corridors while uh, not knowing if the right decision is going to be made in the rooms once the doors close and civil society is out? Uh, and I asked myself this question, why don't I run? And the answer was, yes, that's, that's, the next, that's the next step. I need to take the responsibility. I need to step up the game. And I did, and I was successful in that. Uh, I was elected with the Holos party. Holos in Ukrainian uh, means voice or vote. We are the youngest, also the smallest party in parliament. We have a 50-50 representation. So 50% uh, of us, 10 women and 10 men. Uh, most of us have crossed over, so this is a party composed of anti-corruption uh, activists, of healthcare activists, veterans' rights activists, uh, and today uh, in Parliament uh, the situation is such that we are no longer uh, an opposition, there is no opposition in the Ukrainian Parliament. We are all united be behind President Zelensky to push 
for Ukraine to remain an independent country and the country where democracy is respected. And for this, I must add that civil society is crucial. The voice of civil society is crucial. So when you are uh, crossing over into politics, into the big game, so to speak, you are actually um, not just doing this for yourselves, but you are doing it so that uh, civil society's voice gets amplified in the future. And I will uh, try to address uh, in this discussion, we are having a few of the instruments that are available to us when we cross over through caucuses, women's caucuses. I'm a member of the women caucus in the Ukrainian parliament, which is one of the strongest caucuses today. Uh, through international instruments and international organizations, I would like to speak a bit about the work of the Interparliamentary Union, where I had the honor to have been the president of the Women's Forum, and that offers a lot of instruments to all of you here as civil society. But I think that we need to let our moderator moderate yeah. now, yes? <laughs> You're right. Thank you. So I'll go back to Comrade Abiyodan. And the question here is that public service its essential role is to provide uh, citizens directly, uh, benefits for citizens directly. Can you share with us a few strategies that are useful for public sector efficiency and governance that directly benefits the citizens? Thank you so much for that. Um, so when I crossed over to governance and I ran for office, I was not elected, but I was appointed. And you know, the civil society in Nigeria said, okay, you are there. Remember where you're coming from. Mm -hmm. So the first assignment I did was to create an enabling environment for civil society to engage with the government. Sometimes the people in government think the civil society, you know, we are the watchdogs. You just want to attack the government at every slightest opportunity. But you know, you also have civil society that also have strategic plan and also want to help the government to achieve some of their development agenda. So I made the government realize that, okay, we need to create an enabling environment. And that was what led to my position as an advisor on ICT, CSO and NGO. So it was a new office that was created based on my background as an NGO person. And I introduced a whole lot of strategies and initiatives that I'll also be talking about. Some of them are global initiatives, but they have not been used at my local level. One of it is open government partnership. I don't know if anyone of us know OGP. Yeah, it's a global movement and they started a local uh, hangout to it, which is OGP local. So it's a global partnership that involves members of CSO and also government to work together to create an action plan that they will both work with to address a whole lot of issues, majorly on increasing citizens' voices, citizens' assembly, paying more attention to what we said democracy is all about. Remember, democracy is the government of the people, by the people and for the people. So if you are practicing democracy in your country, then the people, the citizens should be the center state of whatever development program that we're having. And that's the whole essence of OGP. So I introduced OGP into uh, a local government and my local government became the first local government out of 774 local government in Nigeria to sign up to OGP on the global stage. So what that gave us was, you know, having members of civil society, equal member of civil society, society in our government to address an action plan and the first action plan we're able to do was to have a citizen center budget so when a political leader you know at zoom office and you, know, you want to prepare a budget so okay the legislators or the councillors will just go back bring whatever it's they feel it's a priority maybe in just their four corners of their room and bring it and we'll add it to the budget that was the usual way but with the OGP we didn't do that we didn't do it as a usual way. We went down to the community, have a town hall meeting. Some of them were in town hall meetings during the COVID-19. Some of them, we went back to our constituency, asked the stakeholders of different words, what do you want to be captured in your budget? Because we are in the government to serve you. Enough of you being elected and feel, oh yes, the pe people should be thanking me. No, we should be thanking the people for even electing us and you're also doing what we're supposed to do for them. So we asked the citizens in our different words, what do you really want to 
be captured in your budget. And we actually did that in all our constituency. And we have the political will to back up what we're doing. Because one important part of any initiative you have is to have the political will to understand exactly what you are aiming at. Because everybody has gone around doing campaign to promise I'm going to do roads. Actually, they're not going to do it. I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. So in the first time or the first ten, or what they want to do is to achieve all those things that they have laid out to achieve in their manifesto. So, okay, you can do both, but let us go through it in the proper way, empowering the citizens in that process. And that was what we did. One of the priorities of each of our constituency was captured in our year 2022 budget, which shows that yes, so whatever you wanted was captured. And we made sure that there was enough vote financial support to support each of those priorities. About 20 million thousand naira was budgeted in our budget to address some of those priorities. And this has helped the citizen to trust the government and say, yes, it's not the, it's not business as usual. Now, citizens, since CSOs are also involved, they helped us in all the town hall meeting, even developing the instrument that we are supposed to use to, you know, get all these needs from the society. So that's how OGP has helped us. I know you're trying to go to shoot. Yes, I am. <laughs> Let's try to be under three minutes, comrades. We are enjoying your suggestions. I'll cross over to Comrade Lala. And as a young person who has crossed over and has worked with a number of people that have also crossed over, in the reality of understanding that, of course, men still have a bigger portion of these positions, what are some of the strategies and skills that can be used to collaborate with men to see that the issues that women are pushing are being addressed in government thank you very much i think three things um mm. open dialogue collaboration building bridges um in my country political power um political leadership and i believe this is the reality for all of our countries is male highly male dominated and so when women, particularly young women, occupy these spaces, they find it very difficult to navigate through, but also to be able to make impact. So what has really worked for me crossing over and holding this position has been having open dialogue, but also engaging my male partners in the spaces that I work in. And similar to Abiodun, um, I'd just like to also speak on the impact that can be made crossing over into um, government and, and how these strategies are able to help you effectively um, put in place uh, mechanisms or measures that in general pro promote open governance, promote inclusion, promote diversity. Um, in my country, I've facilitated a series of open government working group meetings and this brings together civil society organizations and governments and the office of the president, key ministries and civil society organizations to work on open governance ref reforms in the Gambia. And I've also been able to work in with civil society. There's been a lot of impact that has been made, um, but working now in this position, there's been so many things that we've been able to achieve together with men that occupy these spaces. Um, just in 2021, we held our first presidential election after we ended the dictatorship and I was able to get all political party leaders, including the candidates, the president included, to sign a code of conduct that created the space or committed them to uphold peaceful conduct, peaceful campaigns, peaceful, peaceful election. And in addition to that, we also were able to work together with government and the electoral systems to hold the Gambia's first ever presidential election debate. And I believe all of this we're able to do to look through collaboration, um, through open dialogue, but also um, having these honest conversations with men that hold these positions that we are not here to take these spaces from you we're here to work and contribute our part and with true collaboration and partnership we can give our country the development that it needs it doesn't necessarily have to be competition and back and forth over spaces and who gets to hold them yeah thank you very much i'll go to lesia and well uh, you're responding to this. I'll just leave uh, the question for the comrade in advance so that it just skips straight. And I'll start with your question, then I'll go to Alicia's question. So your question will be, what influence has your transition in from being a young person growing up in a community where women's representation is so linked to, and then you have to cross over? You, you went into government at 19 quite impressive 18 very very impressive i'm so proud of you what influence has it has has it had on the face of the community so you can be thinking through that wow 
she gets to respond to my question, which is what strategies exist to build connection with civil society or other sectors to help achieve one's goals in government? Uh, thanks. Uh, and we have to bear in mind, as I said previously, that mm -hmm. civil society plays a crucial, crucial role sure. uh, in the success once you crossed over. Actually, when you cross over from civil society, your networks are your most reliable partners while you find your way uh, in the politics, mm -hmm. while you uh, go through the d jump through the different challenging hoops that are presented to you in this absolutely new and often very very hostile environment. Mm -hmm. uh, what can you rely on? Women's caucuses is, uh, is one thing, and these women's caucuses, at least in the Ukrainian parliament, they rely on civil society helping them, uh, helping them bring the issues to the table. Uh, what I would like to see more in my country and beyond is for these women's caucuses mm -hmm. to, as well as uh, such gatherings as this one, to have more men present in the room. Uh, because uh, here, in all honesty, we are preaching to the converted. You know, we, we know these issues. They are very close to us at heart. But the men need to be sitting there, not talking, but listening and taking all of this in. <laughs> And then the men can become the <laughs> champions of gender equality in the discussions and in the dialogues that are generally male dominated. Uh, another point what we can use once we have crossed over and we must also have the civil society on the ground with us is the international uh, instruments that are available to us when we become politicians. Mm -hmm. There are regional instruments, there are also international, so inter-parliamentary union. It's a huge, all the international organizations, it uh, encompasses, it unites 170 parliaments, maybe even more, and they have a women forum. Mm -hmm. I had the honor to be the president of that women forum for two years. And with that, they have a huge array of instruments to be used. Some of them are financial instruments. And this is number one, because if you want to do anything, you need to have the money to build those structures, to build those connections, to go out to your constituencies and to have projects. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, the IPU, use that structure, look it up, Google it, uh, get connected with your local, uh, with your national delegations in the Interparliamentary Union and start pushing them to do more on uh, gender equality. And the second instrument which, which the IPU has is the same kind of budgets for youth projects, for having more youth in parliament. So these are two ways to use them. Uh, at the IPU, we also have this thing called the gender parity group. Mm -hmm. So uh, at every session, the parliaments we have, which have issues with providing gender equality or have not uh, have uh, their delegation, which is not equally represented by men and women, they come to this international uh, body, which is encompassed, uh, which is constituted from uh, delegates from all over the world, not just from one region, but all regions. And they have to answer tough questions. What has your government done? What has your parliament done? What kind of legislation have you adopted? Have you got women's caucuses? And uh, it's power because when you come to that uh, test table, to that commission, every time you're at the IPU, it's not pleasant, I can tell you, because I was one of the examinators at that table. So please use those instruments, uh, Google them, look them up. I'm more than happy, I already spoken to some of the colleagues, I'm more than happy to do a Zoom session uh, after this to tell you from the inside how these things can work. And we, we must share this information among ourselves as to what is available to us. Uh, uh, last point, uh, what, uh, something that we need to deal with. So when I was running for election, uh, I, I was reading uh, a lot of surveys and how do people feel about, you know, a woman running. And what struck me is that at least in Ukraine, and I think it will be similar in the rest of the world, when you were talking about a woman running for leadership of the country, uh, the people do not trust a woman to take the leadership. They trust men much, much more. And this is a stereotype. This is a stereotype which has been forming through generations and generations. And I think it's our task to change that because I'm sorry, without having 50-50 representation at that table, we will never have just societies and our people mm. will always suffer. For sure. Thank you very much. I'll go to my honorable, um, right uh, across me and she's responding to a question what has what's been the influence on the face of your community 
with regards to your leadership as a young person? Thank you very much. Um, my influence in the community is, I think I have made a big difference looking at, especially when I did win, being, when I started campaigning rather, I was 18 years old. And by the time I was winning the election, being 19 years old, and I faced a lot of challenges. A lot of people told me, you can't do this. Yeah. Um, in the beginning, my own parents were saying, no, because um, I, I had just got accepted to university. So my own parents were saying, focus on school first, because I was doing law at the time. But I said, why can't I do both? Why can't I go to university and still be a politician? A man can do one, three, four things, and you won't say choose one. Why do I have to pick one? So I said, I'm going to do both. Um, when I first um, started campaigning, all my friends were saying, ah, no, just stop it. In the community itself, being a rural setup, we would have the elderly who would come and advise me to say, don't do it. Um, women belong in the kitchen. Women are supposed to take <laughs> care of children. Why don't you get married? You know, politics would disturb your chances of finding a husband. And those are the things that are being told by elderly yeah. women. And it was so discouraging, but if I had a small heart, I would have stopped then because I had every reason to stop. No finances because I was straight from high school. Mm -hmm. um, I had never had a job before. I had um, little experience in the political field. I was diving with my head first. So after I won and even before I won, when the youth in my community and all of those around me so that I didn't stop. Mm -hmm. No matter how many times they discouraged me, no matter how many reasons I had to turn around and just leave everything and walk away, I didn't stop. Mm -hmm. I continued, I pushed. I continued to push and I almost lost hope because there was so much negativity around me that I even for, I almost lost sight of why I joined politics. Yeah. So like um, the other speaker said, your fellow women will be the first ones to push you down. You're the elderly are also encouraging they're pushing you down. And they're calling us youth disgruntled. They're saying we have no direction. So everything, including the government, everyone is just discouraging you. But I had to continue pushing because I knew that this thing I'm fighting for is bigger than me and it's beyond me. So I shouldn't let my personal feelings get in the way. If I fail, at least I knew I tried. So I continued. And when the youth and the women saw that I'm not stopping, they started joining. They said, OK, we're going to push with you because we've seen that you're not stopping. You're moving. You're pushing. So more youth joined with me. More uh, women came on. and. We were spending nights together and mornings together and campaigning and whatnot. And even after I won, um, they started to put me closer by because they said, if you can do it, even our children can do it. Because now, before it was them who wanted to stand, they said, no, no, no. We want our children to stand because they know they are closer to the next generation. They, are, they can speak for themselves. We can't always be speaking for you. It's time you had your own voice. I, your voice matters as well. So as I am speaking today, so many youth have been um, coming forward saying they're preparing for the next election. We've been working with other organizations in identifying these young people. Um, young boys and young girls in high school are coming forward saying, after I finish high school, I am preparing for the next election. Wonderful. So we're going to have a group of very young people coming forward. So this is what my influence has done. Being the youngest female in the whole country hasn't been an easy battle, but at least I know that it's made a difference somehow, somewhere. Viva! Viva! Thank you very much for, for that, Honorable. I come back to uh, Malaysiana and um, a usual conflict of communication. How, um, what are the good practices that we can use to communicate to citizens about the work we're doing? I think we can agree that that has been one of the biggest 
challenges between ourselves on this other end, not just as the government, but even as the CSOs and trying to communicate with communities. And I would like to hear that from a perspective of someone who is in government now. Thank you. I think it is one of the uh, challenges, uh, communication. What is it that uh, people want to hear and uh, uh, what is it that we can tell them and how? Um, I think that we can um, um, come up with um, uh, different strategies. One of them is to have uh, community engagements. We can uh, have community engagements, call, uh, call in uh, stakeholders like um, uh, village headmen, uh, chiefs, uh, uh, you know, teachers in the, in the community, and uh, the villagers themselves, where you, you discuss uh, these issues. Um, in my community, uh, I should say that um, uh, uh, we are blessed because um, uh, we have um, uh, a chieftainess uh, who is uh, very, very committed and uh, you know engaged when it comes to uh, issues to do with um, women. So we we need to push an agenda where the community gets involved. Let's talk as a community. Uh, another another um, uh, strategy is to. Uh, uh, engage schools. Uh, we 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 inculcate in our learners early, early in life that uh, you know they need to know that it is important to regard women as equal. Uh, you know the girl child is as as good as um, as a boy child, and um, also to uh, I, I guess to um, enact laws that can um, uh, hold the executive accountable on some of the commitments that they make. I think that is key to enforce and ensure that, you know, ex if the executive is not, you know, um, uh, being accountable on the commitments that they make, they are punished. That will also help. Another um, um, a strategy is to, um, I think to uh, embed in uh, in our uh, learning school curricula, yes, uh, to ensure that uh, um, educators, the teachers, are made accountable by you know teaching and um, uh, 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 ensuring that uh, this is followed by, by by the education sector. I think that would be very helpful. Um, coming to us as um, members of parliament, um, it's our role to engage the community. It is our role to engage everyone in the in the in the constituency by uh, talking to them, you know, and um, um, making them aware of um, uh, of our role as uh, as as uh, members of parliament in terms of uh, uh, communicating and. Um, 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 uh, educating them on our on our role as members of parliament i think that is uh, that is key yeah thank you very much honorable i'll go lastly to comrade uh, Kristen. and of course as soon as you start working with people in government it usually becomes difficult because of diverse views and what would we want to hear from you what practices can we explore to ensure that we're working with governments? Um, what term could, could I use? We are working amicably. <laughs> we have an amicable environment where we can work with the government to see that some of our goals are attained. Thank you. Um, first and foremost, I think uh, when you're in this um, business of ensuring that women have to win their seats, yeah. you must then figure out who do you want to work with apart from these women. So for my organization in Kenya, FIDA, we realize that a very important, uh, a very early opportunity, we must work with the parliamentary caucus in Kenya. And in Kenya, we call it KEWOPA, Kenya Women Parliamentary Association. With that kind of caucus, you realize that you may need to bring them in whenever there's an agenda regarding a legislative uh, instrument policy 
whatever it is that you want to fight for. With such a caucus, you are able to build their capacity because sometimes we assume that the women we elect know about these laws. Sometimes they, they have no information, they have no idea how to debate in parliament. And when it comes to parliament, it's about debate. And the people who actually win that debate are the best debaters. So we realize we must build their capacities because being elected is one thing, but giving us what we expect for you from five years is another. So we must then be able to marry quantity and quality, quantity being the numbers, quality being what do we expect from you for five years. So building their capacity, work with caucuses that uh, you know you can get these MPs at the opportune time. Flagging out what you need to do, this debate is coming up, what do you need to say, what do you need to convince the male colleagues. This is something that we realize it is working in Kenya. This is something that we realize you are able to showcase as a female MP, you have something to say and you, you must be listened to. Again, in terms of uh, a government, we realize that the political parties are the vehicle to producing the numbers. So then we realize that you must be able to factor in how do you work with political parties which are male dominated? Mm -hmm. How do you persuade them that please, as you present your numbers and you present your, uh, the people you want to be nominated, let women be there. So working with political parties because they are the vehicle is also very key and building the capacity for them to understand why is gender important and reflecting on why we have to have women. So for me, I can say uh, parliamentary caucuses and political parties are very essential partners in terms of working with the government. Mm -hmm.